looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Some of it, they didn't get an awful lot, but they gave it to the Lord. So God says, whatever you give, do you feel some pain when you give it? Some loss, in a sense, a a, a sacrifice. You gave the best. You gave it with the right heart. But when you walked away from this thing, watch this, you knew you gave. Not, okay, it's just my my, my tip to God, my little thing that's in my account system. It automatically is withdrawn. Boom, boom, boom. I got all of this stuff. I do everything. I got my water bill, my electric bill, my cable bill, my, my gift to the church bill. And it's done. It's a sacrifice. Now... I need to say this because some of you might already be retreating to this. Is the church struggling financially? Is the pastor not getting paid enough? What's the problem out there? There is no problem. Our church is financially stable. We have money in the bank. Um, We get paid plenty, more than what we deserve. I'll speak for me. Dennis can say the same. We are so grateful. You guys gave us a Christmas and 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 an appreciation pastor's gift. I really want to thank you for that Maserati you bought me. I'm sorry, Dennis. Uh, no, I'm joking. But I want you to know you've done great. So it's not about the church is not going to fold, okay? The, they're not going to turn the power off, uh, maybe if there's a storm. But there's no power going off. Why am I saying this? Because I want you to be rich and full in God and his truth. I want you to experience the very best. I, I'm just wondering if there's just acres of diamonds in all of us who are dirty sometimes. And God says, I'm going to pop it out. And that's why this truth is here for all of us. I get so excited about it. I I don't know what it's going to be like, but if we just do it and hang on for the ride, it'll be great. So now we have the sacrifice, and I hope we remember that. But now that's the premise. Now let's talk about the promise. This is is God's part. This will be easy for you and me. The premise part's kind of hard part, you know, what we have to do to give. And now here's the promise, that God will provide for all my needs. God will provide for all my needs. The verse says, and would you read verse 19 and 20, everyone, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. So let's look at number one. If he's going to provide for us, who's the source? What's the source? It's going to be my God shall supply these things. My God shall do this. I pondered over this whole thing because if you want to, you'll, you'll enjoy doing this. Look back at the verse. You see where it says, and my God? Will you circle the word my there in that verse 19? That's quick. Just do my. Circle it. Boom. Go to verse 20 where it begins to say now to. Now circle the word our. So here you have my God in verse 19. Then he goes back to it and he says our God in verse 20. Now, why did he do that? I'm going to give you Ponzism. Ponzism means it's my speculation. It works for me. You decide how it means to you. I don't believe at all in this context that Paul is saying, I've got a better God than you do. It's not that. I don't think he's saying that. He's not saying that I have my God and you Philippians have your God. Okay, what he is saying is that he he has such an intimate relationship with his God. A God that he knows so well as a benevolent giving father. One that will take care of the needs of his children. That should he ask for bread, he won't be given a stone. All right, He knows that God is out there. So that's why he, just for this moment, he's intimately letting them know, my God, my God will do this for you. And maybe he's given a little bit of a gig. Like saying, that's what my God will do. Do you have the same God I do? Because if you had the same God I do, you'd have the same confidence I do. So how's your God doing? How are you doing with your God? Don't we have the same God? And, of course, then he comes back and he wraps his ever-loving arms around those Philippian people in verse 20. He says, our God and Father. And he's, no, 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 no. We're all the same in this thing. But I just want you to know my God will take care of you. And I believe those of you that have that kind of intimacy with God that you know he will take care of you. I would love to parade the people in here where that you have experienced the supernatural hand of God providing for you through other people that knew you had a need and they gave you just at that time what you needed. Now, it could have been an item. It could have been money. But you know what else? It could have been something that's far more expensive than money and items. And what would that be? Anybody know? T-I-M-E, time. Someone gave you of themselves. Well, I just want you to know we can celebrate in that. That's what makes it so special right here. The source is my God will take care of us. All right, let's look at the scope of this. It says here, the scope says, shall supply all your need. 
Now, while you're kind of marking that word scope in your little outline there, you might want to remember it. It doesn't say that God shall supply some of your needs. It doesn't say God will, that God might supply your needs. It doesn't say that God will supply your greed. It says that he will, a promise, supply how much? All of what? Your need. Now, you had to be here last week when we gave the message on contentment, which was a, an entire message just on the concept of contentment. Some of you were asking me about contentment. What does the Bible have to say? That was the message for you. And in that, what we learned was that when we know that God's going to take care of us in such a way that he doesn't necessarily give us our greedy things, like we've got to have all of this stuff, but he will give us the basic needs of life. And everybody has a basic need of life. We don't know exactly what it is, but there's a basic need that we have, probably food, clothing, shelter, water, that kind of thing. So what's not covered in that promise, that scope there, all right? The consequences of laziness and sin. Now, I'd like to have everybody look at the verse because I want you to know that part of the promise and the premise that God's going to take care of us is that he's not going to bankroll your sin. He's not going to bankroll lazy people, people that sit around in what I call smoke and joke but aren't doing some blood, sweat, and tears out there. And I'm not against smoking and all that. I just want you to know, just deal with your life in a way that's fully with him, all right? The consequences of laziness and sin. Proverbs, I, what do I say about smoking? You and the Lord work that out. I think we need to take care of our bodies so you don't go either way too far. Proverbs 23, 20, and 21. Would you look at this verse? I want you to see two different things in this verse. It says, Do not be with heavy drinkers of wine or with gluttonous eaters of meat. Now, if you will, don't mark the word heavy drinkers of wine and don't underline gluttonous eaters of meat. I want you to underline the word with in that. Do not be with those people. Don't be with those heavy eaters of meat. The first concept is don't be with them. Then it says, for the heavy drinker and the glutton will come to poverty and drowsiness will clothe one with rags. So here's what I'm seeing in this passage. It's saying, first of all, take the second part of that, that if I am a heavy drinker, as I'm heavily drinking, it's going to cost me time to, uh, to drink, time to get the alcohol, time to get all of this stuff. It's going to cost me my money. It's going to take me away from doing something great, and now I'm doing something that's not so great. And then if I'm around a lot of eating, eat a lot, have all the food, the best delicacies of life, the more expensive, supersizing my burgers, all that kind of stuff, and I'm just feeding, 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 that's going to take time. It's going to take energy. It's going to cause me then to get tired. So I'm looking at all of that. And I'm saying, when I'm that, it will clothe me with rags. Now, that's the ultimate when I'm doing this, it will be rags. So let's just translate that. There are some people that are doing without things that are absolutely necessary, whether it's transportation of cars or gasoline that they need to get along. Maybe it's uh, communication things like telephone or the kind of telephones that they need. Maybe it's basic Internet service so they can communicate. I, I don't know, whatever the basic need of life is, something your children need that they can't go out to work for, but mom and dad need to help for, but they can't get that, whatever it is. Could it be that they have all of that, but someone else owns it because you spent that money on food for that other person and all that stuff for them instead of now not spending it on the luxuries of life and providing for the needs of your family. I don't know. And then it also says, if I kick it up one more notch, the word with those people. Now, when you're with them, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to drink. doesn't necessarily mean you're going to eat that food. It could mean that you're on a slippery slope. You turned your eyes towards Sodom and you might end up there doing that kind of junk. But it does mean that you're with them. So let's just say that you're not participating yet. I want you to step up and say it's a possibility. Why would I even want to be with those kinds of people? What value am I getting? The only time I'd want to be with those people is if, if I'm actually there for a pointed opportunity to present the gospel to them or to build a kind of uh, relationship with them that if we're talking story about God. There's some reason I am there. I'm probing for relational issues with the gospel in Jesus Christ. If I'm just socializing then being with them, God is warning me about that kind of stuff. Because if I'm with them, pretty soon I'm going to have to try to keep up with them. And something for you young people for a moment, okay? I'm not necessarily talking about our teenagers. I'm talking about sometimes young married couples. Young married couples sometimes get into financial bondage because they often try to have now what their parents took 25 years to get. 
And so they often will plunge themselves into a tremendous amount of financial stress because they have to have what mom and dad have. Or they look at what others have and they say, hey, our friends over here, they have that. I should have that too. The difference is what their friends have is all of that stuff, but a horrific amount of indebtedness too. And then you don't see that, but eventually they begin to crumble and stumble and all of this. But now you kind of bought into that same value system and you're struggling. So what I'm saying is go back and develop a biblical mindset a confidence in God, be wary of the friends that you are around, the company with whom you keep, so that you will not be on a slippery slope that would hinder you. That's why this passage is built on a premise. The promise is I'll take care of you, but not just to bankroll you for all the luxuries in life that you want and the misspending of your funding. Or you say, okay, um, now you want me to take care of your basic need of life, but you had all the rest, but you took what I gave you for the basic need of life and you wasted on something that wasn't a basic need of life. And now you want me to bail you out? Now, here's the way I think about that. I think if you truly change your mind, you get broken, you really learn, and you stay that condition of humility, God's mercy and grace will kick in immediately, kind of like an afterburner, and he'll say, Poof! all right, now you, got, now you are where I want you to be, and I'll take care of you. So he's not there to squash you like a bug. He's just there to get your attention because he loves you so much. So the consequence of laziness and sin, God's not going to cover you with finances for that. The second one would be your wants. I have to be careful about that because I do believe God is a generous God and he does give us a lot more than what we probably need because he is so good to us. But I think we have to be very careful. Again, that's a slippery slope. I did some research at this part of the, the message preparation, and I found out that in 1890, sociologists were working with a lot of people, and they were trying to reduce and discover down to what does man need as a basic need of life. Now, I'm not going to give you the list. I will tell you this. They agreed as a team of researchers that there were only 16 basic things of life that a person needed to survive. I'd love to get that list. I wish I knew what it was, but they said there were 16. Now, here's what was so interesting. I don't know if life changed or man's attitude changed, but less than 100 years later, another group of researchers went out there and they came to a different conclusion. They said that man doesn't need 16 basic things to survive. They needed to have 98 things to survive. So I'm wondering if the first group didn't do good enough research or the second group did good research, but what's happened is we have developed such a mindset that now we are putting over the threshold more than what we really need that maybe we really don't need. And here's what I'm wondering. That if I live another 25 or 30 years, hopefully 50 years, I'd love to li live to be 100 as long as I have my mind. I'm supposed to laugh at that. All right. But anyway, if we'll have now from 98 to 150 things that we're going to need in life. And it'd be interesting to do a study if I went all the way back to the Bible days. Listen, folks, I'll end this point on, on this, this, this here. You and I, we don't even have to be a Christian to honestly admit that if we lived in those Bible days... They didn't have the same things that we needed today. and we, we have things today that we probably don't need and that we can survive. Number three, the supply. According to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, God will take care of all my legitimate needs because God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, God never goes bankrupt. His supply never runs out. You never get to the end of his uh, rainbow, so to speak. He's got plenty. God takes care of us. Do I hear an amen on that? And in time he will. So that's the supply, how good God is. And here's the submission. Number four, now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Now I was wondering why he put that in there. And I'm going to give you again my opinion. He was thanking the people of Philippi for taking care of him. He was now reminding them that you go ahead and give. And when you give, God will take care of all your needs. You give first, God will take care of you. But he still wasn't giving glory to the Philippians. He wasn't giving glory to Epaphroditus who did a lot to get to him to bring him this stuff. He gave ultimate glory to the Lord. And, and that's what I want you to end this whole series on. Everything begins and ends on God. It's all about God. It's not about us. And if you feel God has let you down and you want to blame God for just for a moment, I'm, I'm hoping you would be objective enough in your pain and your, and your skepticism about God to, to come to this and say, wait a second. I've been blaming God all these years or all this time or right now in my life. I'm a little upset at him because he didn't come through, blah, 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 blah. Or you're okay, but you're looking at your friend. Then you go, there's something wrong with God. For just a moment, if, if you would at least possibly entertain this, that maybe that it's not God's fault. It could be your understanding of who God is, and there's something that's not computing. You're hitting the right keys, but the computer isn't on. 
That's not a slam. And so what I'm saying is, would you do a serious, objective, open-minded study of the scriptures and you will come to the conclusion that myriads of people have come to who understood God from Genesis time to even to today that God is a God who will supply your needs. And we submit to him and say, Lord, if you gave us nothing, if you let us starve to death or freeze to death, it's okay because as a Christian, we're going to heaven. That's the glory of God. Now I want to end with the postscript. Now he gave him that last bit of truth, and then he wants to say goodbye. So he graciously says goodbye with this postscript. Most preachers, you'll notice, don't even hit this, and I wanted to end with this because he did put it in Scripture. God wanted it there, so here's what he says. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. didn't say greet all the saints. He said every saint. Why did he say every instead of all? Because I think he wanted them greeted individually, not just as one man. Say, I love y'all. No. Stay with us. He just took a whole letter and he gave truths and teachings to the people at Philippi. But now he says, greet every saint or every believer that's there. He didn't say, greet the ones who are rich. He didn't say, greet the ones who are poor. He didn't say, greet the ones who gave to you to give to me. He didn't say, greet those who, who, who didn't give and so be friendly with them, manipulate them into giving. So be especially friendly to them. He didn't say that. He didn't say those who are walking with God and those who were, he just says, greet every single one of them. That's what grace is about. That's when we as a church say, you know what, I hear this message, but I know so-and-so in this church, and I know that person, and this person, that person. We begin to marginalize. Don't do that. Don't do that. What you do is you love on them. You pray for them. You're there. Now, if you hear a gossip or a negative thing, you've got to rebuke it. The Bible says to do that. But at the same time, we're to greet everybody. Then he goes on to say, the brethren who are with me greet you. He didn't say the rich brethren, the ones you gave to, or the special brethren. He says, we all greet you, man. It's not about Philippi. It's about kingdom work. I'm in Rome. You're in Philippi. We're all in this thing together. It's not here in the poly. It's all over the islands. It's all over the world. We are one big kingdom for God as long as it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And so it's not about denomination, not about churches, but it is about the veracity of Scripture, the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture, the sufficiency of Scripture. Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. God is the only God. Salvation is by faith alone. Once we have that, that's what he's saying here, brethren. Those who are with me greet you. We're all in this together. And he says, all the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. And now who's of Caesar's household? Well, it could be the folks that were there at the same time in Rome with them at one time. So he's just letting them know. And by the way, when I hear Caesar's household, I'd like to, I'm going to really reduce it. Government workers. These were the government workers that were working for Caesar, helping Caesar's little empire do what they needed. The grunt workers, I'm going to say people mostly like you and me right here, those kind of people. He says, we all greet you. You be sure to say hello to them. And he's saying, I'm saying so long for now, but I wanted to end by saying, thank you for your gift. To God be the glory. Keep those cards and letters coming in because God's going to take care of your need. Praise be to God. And we're all in this thing together. And Ponzism again. That's Ponzism. I may be reading more in here. But I'm wondering if Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God is so smart that Paul is now saying this and the convicted people are out there that are saying, we'll give to Paul, but we won't give to da-da-da. We're going to give to this person because he's our special friend and we're not going to give to him. Paul is kind of subtly saying, <laughs> I'm thanking you for giving to me, but everybody greets you. So kind of like, remember everyone here, okay? Don't forget anybody. Nobody's left out, okay? Everybody's part of the club, all right? And that's what he's saying to us, and that's what I'd like us to say. We'll have our favorite missionaries. Some are going to go deeper water, need more help from time to time. But let's never forget people. Let's remember everybody is somebody in his body, and every part of God's body needs every part of God's body. We're all in this thing together, and to God be the glory, we finished Philippians. How many of you began with us when we studied Philippians? Get, it, get the material, read the book. You know, you say, whoa, what, this, what God gave you. I'm going to tell you, God has this truth for you too. You open up your Bible. The Holy Spirit that taught me taught you. The books that I read, you can get too. All you got to do is have a heart turned toward the Lord. And if you do, if you do, if you do, and God gives you some more insight on this, would you email me? Because I need what you have for me too. Because I want to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord. The big picture of this... You're never more like Christ than when you're giving. And so don't think about how much you give. Think about how much he gave. He gave his only son for you and me on the cross so undeserving. We weren't great missionaries for him then. We were great sinners. And he said, I still gave to you in your lost condition. And when Jesus died, he didn't die for those that were worshiping him. He died for those that were nailing him to the cross. He died for everybody. 
And when he did all that, he paid our sin debt for us. And all we have to do is to receive it. We receive it by faith. We open up that package and we say, thank you, Lord, that it's not by good works. It's not by my money. It's all about you. And I'm trusting you as the one who forgave me of all my sins. Why don't you settle that deal right now? Take care of the deal right now. Trust Christ. Seal it right now. Let's bow our heads. What a sweet time we had with Jesus. How he loved us so much that he wanted to tell us truths. And and how good Paul was to have such a great spirit to partner with the Lord in humility, to, to be beat up and gone through all that crud of life. And then God to say, I, I want you, Paul, and I want you to have relationships with people some 2,000 years ago because I'm going to use you now to write some letters to them that other people are going to read. And, and so you know what? We're a fellowship of the sufferings of Paul. We can fellowship with the generosity of the Philippians right now. But it all begins at the same epicenter, the cross of Calvary. Oh, my friend, whether you ever come back here or not, I want you to come to the cross of Calvary. Believe that Jesus went to that cross. Yeah, he was born and laid in a manger. He was king then. He will function as king in the future here. But I want you to know he was born to die. And he died for you on the cross. And his blood that was splattered all over the cross and the rocks below was perfect sinless blood that was a sweet-smelling sacrifice in the nostrils of his father. And he did all that for you and me. He took your sin and my sin on himself. And he says, I'm going to forgive you, my friend. Don't... Don't, don't come to me with your works. I know you want to, and I know that's kind of a nice thing. Good, good things are good things. But when you do that, then you're saying, my son's sacrifice wasn't good enough. No, he was my son. He was God. He was perfect. So just forget about all that good stuff and just trust him. Just believe that that's the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, not your works are the way. So would you say this to the Lord? Lord, I'm a sinner. I believe you gave yourself on the cross for me. I am trusting in you as my Savior so I can receive eternal life in the Holy Spirit and home in heaven and all this. I can't promise you that I'll be a whole lot different right away, but Lord, I, I, wanna, I, I want you. I, I, have a, I have you in my life now as my Savior because I've trusted you and I, I know I'm going to have a new life. I have eternal life and a new life. So, Lord, just thank you for forgiving me of my sin. Now, my friend, you put it in your own words, as long as it's by faith and not by works, and it's in Christ and not yourself. You're putting your faith in him. No no book in the Bible could describe the consequence of you not trusting Christ as Savior after you die. So is there anyone in here that is right now between you and the Lord, settling your eternal destiny by faith alone. You're trusting in Him. I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell, but the best in I have, I'm trusting in you to give me eternal life. To exalt our Lord. And then use it as a springboard for this week. God is going to specifically bring people across your path. And, and as kind and as good as all of you are, don't be afraid to begin realizing those people are placed there by God for you to begin and say, Pastor's right. I, I, I got I to get a little bit more assertive in outreach. If not, folks, we're going to dwindle and God's going to remove his hand on us. And so let's not do that. Let's be a part of this. How many of you would like to have prayer because you want to give too and your giving is going to be whatever God's given to you. Relationships with others, you're going to give that relationship to God and say, Lord, help me to reach that person for Christ. I'm going, to, I'm going to give what I can to further the kingdom. Whatever I have, Lord, I'm going to give my time. I'm going to give my tickets. I'm going to give whatever is necessary so that you're exalted. How many of you, in your own measure, would like to have prayer? And I don't know what need you might have, but my hand is up. I'm going to be the first one. I want you to pray for me. How many of you would, would join me and, and pray with me and for me? Father, with humble hearts, we come before you. And we thank you for our church and the sweet, dearest people here. I thank you for all those that faithfully serve our children. I pray they're getting these messages on a regular basis and you're filling our our people with truth and growing them in every area. Lord, I I, I thank you for what these people have given. This is like the Philippian church. And and there's so many Epaphroditus that are bringing through our mission 
program to others that have need. And I thank you for them. And that, Father, that we would really be a willing giver. And help us, Father, now to realize that we can talk about Christ and that we would. And, that, Father, that our church would be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear. Oh, 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 oh,